Good evening to you and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Sophie Erber. Today, the Senate began the impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. Democrats say Trump incited that deadly riot that unfolded at the U.S. Capitol last month, but Republicans insist the trial is now unconstitutional. D.C.'s Raquel Martin reports as today, for the first time, both sides made their cases in our top story at 5. Be seated. Tuesday, the Senate kicked off the second impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. Incredibly important trial. Michigan Democratic Senators Debbie Stabenow and Gary Peters say it's clear Trump unleashed the deadly riot at the Capitol last month. The facts uh, are overwhelming. Hope uh, that the senators would uh, have an open mind, uh, would listen to the, the arguments. On the Senate floor, lead impeachment manager Congressman Jamie Raskin shared violent footage of the attack. You ask what a high crime and misdemeanor is under our Constitution? That's a high crime and misdemeanor. But the former president's legal team argues Trump is not responsible for the violence and argues the trial itself is unconstitutional. If we restrict liberty, to attain security, we will lose both. We can't have any removal in this case because he's an ex-president. Missouri Republican Josh Hawley says this is why he will not vote to convict the former president. He expects most Republicans to agree with him. You've got 45 senators already on the record saying we just don't have the authority. This thing is not going anywhere. I think our Democrat colleagues know that. And frankly, I think it is a terrible, terrible waste of time. Kansas Republican Senator Roger Marshall says former President Trump isn't to blame. The president was, was well within his rights to have freedom of speech. This week, both sides will have up to 16 hours to present their case and four hours for closing arguments. A final vote is expected on Monday. In Washington, Raquel Martin. A man wanted by the Sioux City Police Department in connection to a November homicide has been captured on the Gulf Coast. 36-year-old Roderick Banks was arrested yesterday in Pritchard, Alabama. Now, he's currently being charged with first-degree murder in connection to the death of Solomon Blackbird. He was taken into custody with the help of the U.S. Marshal Service and is currently awaiting extradition back to Sioux City. Blackbird was shot back on November 1st in Sioux City and later died of his injuries. Police say that Banks possibly shot Blackbird over a drug debt. Now, if convicted of first-degree murder, Banks does face life in prison. Today, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem delivering a special address to the South Dakota legislature. During that address, Noem saying that the state would have an unprecedented $125 million in unexpected one-time money for 2021. About $71 million of that includes CARES Act funding the state has access to. Now, Noem today says that the state should invest that money in long-term projects. Times that my mission is to make South Dakota safer and stronger and healthier for our kids and our grandkids. To do that, we need to take this perspective. Whatever action that we take with this money, it needs to fix something for 20 or 30 years or longer. That is why I'm proposing important infrastructure investments like broadband, the Brittle Fund, dam repair, and radio tower equipment. While a South Dakota judge struck down an initiative passed by South Dakota voters that legalized recreational marijuana across the state, the list of Iowa officials supporting legalization is also growing. State Senator Joe Balcom is leading the renewed charge for legalization. Balcom wants the state to regulate marijuana just like it does alcohol for adults 21 and older. Illinois made nearly $700 million doing this last year. Balcom says legalizing marijuana in the state of Iowa would create four to 5,000 jobs and 60 to $100 million in revenue per year. Today, an education subcommittee in the House will discuss a bill that would reduce funding for schools that use the New York Times 1619 Project. That's a program that reveals how the history of slavery still shapes America today. It was developed by Waterloo native Nicole Hannah-Jones. However, the bill claims that the project tries to deny the fundamental principles our country was founded on. The project's creator, however, disagrees. The law also does not accurately describe what the 1619 Project curriculum is. It's not a history curriculum. It's not designed to replace the standard social studies that students get. It is supplementary. It is journalism. It is being taught in not just uh, social studies, but in English. It is being taught in music classes. So it's not even designed to be a history curriculum that replaces anything that students are currently learning. 
Similar efforts tonight also underway in Arkansas and in Mississippi. And it's time tonight for our first check on the weather. Meteorologist Marcus Beasley standing by. Marcus, uh, in the Midwest, I know usually we call the frozen tundra our neighbors <laughs> to the east, the state of Wisconsin, but it was freezing cold again today, albeit uh, we had some sun. That's right. The sun actually helping a little bit, make it feel a little bit nicer outside with that sun. But for the most part, just another very cold day here throughout Siouxland today. High temperature of 11 degrees in Sioux City, 10 in Wayne and Cherokee, 9 in Lamar's and Orange City. A high of 7 in Storm Lake and Carroll today. So cold all throughout the region tonight. Expect temperatures to drop down again right around 0 to slightly below 0 degrees tonight. So it's going to be another sub-zero night throughout Siouxland. We could see a few snow flurries out there tonight. It does look like our higher chances at snow will come later this week. I'll have more details on that in the 9 on 9 forecast. Sophie? All right, thanks, Marcus. Let's take a quick look now at the latest COVID-19 number. Here in Siouxland, Woodbury County Health reporting 18 cases in the past day. The two-week positivity rate has increased just slightly to 7.1%. In Nebraska, Madison County with 387 active cases, the county reporting a total of 42 deaths during the pandemic. And in South Dakota, Clay County reports a weekly positivity rate of 5% with 36 cases listed as active. And the latest CDC data revealing Iowa is toward the bottom of the list when it comes to vaccination rates. We know this, but help might be on the way to streamline the process of scheduling an appointment. Today, the Department of Public Health picking Microsoft to create a vaccine scheduling system to make the process a little bit easier. The company will be responsible for developing and deploying the online registration system. Tomorrow, over at the Tyson Event Center in Sioux City, Siouxland District Health will be holding their first public vaccination clinic. A thousand doses of the first round of the vaccine will be given out to Tier 1 individuals, such as people over the age of 65, EMS workers, and early elementary educators. All of them were by appointment. Up until now, Siouxland District Health has had a more targeted approach to the vaccine rollout. I'm pretty much focused on getting through the healthcare professionals. Originally, which we had a goal of by the end of January with the first doses. So those have been done here at Siouxland District Health Department. But now with the partners, if we have enough doses, we're going to move into the um, Tyson Event Center. Those with appointments tomorrow are again being asked to show up at their scheduled time and have a photo ID ready to show your eligibility. And just a reminder for people here in Woodbury County, starting tomorrow at 3 p.m., those eligible for this round of vaccinations will get another opportunity to sign up for another vaccination clinic being held on February 17th. This time, however, Siouxland District Health will have a hotline for people to call and sign up. That number, 712-234-3922. That number is there on your screen. It is shown here and also we can find it on our website. Just visit this story at SiouxlandProud.com. The CDC tonight says even after your vaccination, if you get one, which research shows is about 95% effective in preventing the virus, you should continue following their recommendations. Some of those being wearing a mask, practicing social distancing, and limiting the amount of people at your gatherings. But that guidance is leading many people to wonder, when will things go back to normal? KCAU 9 News spoke with experts about why those recommendations are still in place for you, even after you get a vaccine, and asked them how soon people here in Siouxland could see their lives go back to how it was. There's lots of different uh, variants, uh, mutations of the virus that are out circulating right now. And uh, we're not exactly certain how effective the new the vaccines are going to be against the different variants. O'Toole adds there is also some research being done on whether or not people who are asymptomatic carriers of the disease can still spread the virus, meaning experts are still not sure if you can catch it even after getting vaccinated and are asymptomatic. You can spread it to others. One in 10 people age 65 and older has Alzheimer's dementia. People with Alzheimer's rely on social interaction, which has been halted by the pandemic to help fight the disease. And for one Siouxlander, isolation has made dealing with it, quote, unequivocally worse. Coming up tonight at 10, KCAU 9's Lydia Vasquez explains the effects the pandemic has had on Siouxlanders who are battling Alzheimer's or dementia, and also what you can do to support your loved ones who also have it. Well, change can sometimes be the only constant, and how we adapt says a lot. You'll meet an artist tonight who has traded acrylics for snow as a medium coming up.
And it looks like we might see a few flurries out there tonight. More snow chances throughout the week and sub-zero temperatures look to stay around. Details on all of that after the break. You're watching KCAU 9 News with Sophie Erber and meteorologist Marcus Beasley. This is KCAU 9 News at 5. It looks like a cold Tuesday as well. Wednesday and Thursday, we might once again get out of the negatives and reach up above zero. Right here's a picture sent to us from a deer in the snow in Dakota Dunes, South Dakota. If you have any pictures to send to us, go ahead and go to SiouxLandProud.com, click on the weather tab, drop down to send us your photos, and upload some pictures to our gallery, and we'll pick some of them to show during our newscasts. Sophie? It's a very technologically advanced deer. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Well, what if detecting COVID-19 was as easy as a dog smelling a treat? These four-legged friends are no ordinary pups. They're trained to find the virus, and we'll show you how next. But first, we've all seen graffiti, but have you seen it painted with snow? We'll take you to the Windy City when we come back. Over 50 years ago, Ron and Donna Harris took a Morningside Avenue shop and turns it into a home for their business, their family, and many friends. On this week's Siouxland Stories, I'll talk with them about their memories and what's next. Siouxland Stories, Thursday on KCAU 9 News. All this cold weather making one Chicago artist very happy. Who would think? Aaron Ivory explains how most of this year, this local artist works with acrylic paint, but come wintertime, his favorite medium is the snow itself. For most of us, a snowman is about as artistic as we get during the long winter months. But for Eduardo via Keating, snow is a treasured medium and a brick wall, the perfect canvas. I love snow, I love winter. It all started about 10 years ago with a random snowball. I just threw a ball and it got stuck on the wall and, and I said, there's something here. So I went back the day after and started drawing. The beginning of what he now calls snow graffiti art. First one that I did that it was kind of a long line. It was nothing lasts, nothing is forever. Using newly fallen snow and the most tender pads, Eduardo turns winter doldrums into hopeful messages and beautiful pictures. Joy, summer's around the corner, temporarily, pretty cool. I usually don't, don't think too much about what I'm gonna do, and that's more fun for me. Like the time he came up with this Chicago favorite. I try to, to write positive messages. One of the messages was, don't complain of things that you can change, and this is one of them. For most, the artist behind the snow graffiti remains a mystery. But every once in a while, Eduardo is happily caught in the act. Awesome snow baby. Hey, rock on! It's great when people when people say that they they like it and they appreciate it. So yeah, that's that's awesome. His spontaneous work has been spotted in Pilsen, Logan Square, Wicker Park, and Printers Row, but doesn't last long, melting away in the afternoon sun. I wrote uh, uh, New Year's resolutions to see how it was then coming down as everyone's New Year's resolutions always fade out. Finding humor and beauty in the bitter cold. I do much more than just playing with the snow. I hope to cheer them up. A snow-inspired Salvador Dali with a Chicago heart. Should try that around here. Well, it seems like most dogs can smell their food from a mile away, but how about sniffing for COVID-19? We'll show you some canines doing just that next. When you're getting tested for coronavirus, the most common method is a nasal swab. But what if something else could detect COVID-19? Something with four legs and maybe a tail and also a keen sense of smell. Reporter Devin Walsh tells us about research seeing if dogs are really capable of sniffing out COVID-19. This litter of puppies could be a tool in saving lives one day. They're Labrador Retrievers, born at Auburn University's Canine Performance Sciences Program. And they're already getting early training, getting used to loud noises. They may one day be bomb-sniffing dogs in an event like the Super Bowl. This is Kitty. Kitty is one of our breeding females. Pam Haney with Auburn University says dogs like Kitty are trained to detect explosives, but that dogs can be trained on any target even a virus. We have done previous research projects showing that dogs can detect a virus. Being able to detect a virus, we felt that and confident that 
could we isolate the particular virus related to SARS-CoV-2 that yes, a dog being able to find a virus could potentially find that virus. Auburn conducted research on whether dogs could detect a generic coronavirus, not specifically COVID-19. Dogs are trained around a wheel like this one to sit when they find the scent. Do you think dogs could be trained to sniff out coronavirus? It's very likely that they can. Paul Wagoner with Auburn says training dogs on biological targets could prove useful in the future. We are focused on biological targets. We're actually focusing a lot more on the next emergent threat that might be out there. To these dogs, finding a target is fun. But researchers around the world say teaching a dog to sniff out coronavirus might be a useful tool at facilities like hospitals or nursing homes. It is a possibility to use dogs for that operation. Um, the dogs that we are developing here at Auburn are definitely capable of doing that line of work should it come to an operation that the world needs. And right after the break, one more check on your forecast. Don't go away. Before we wrap up here at 5, let's check in first with Tim for what's coming up at 6. Hi, Tim. Hey, good afternoon. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds has turned to Fox News to explain her decision to roll back COVID-19 restrictions in the state. We'll take a look at what else she's saying coming up tonight at 6. Still ahead as well, uh, KCAU 9 reporter Mallory Smith taking a look at how Siouxland is working toward a new normal post-coronavirus. And stickers are one way that hospitals have really started to be able to show uh, patients that have been screened for COVID-19. Now one hospital, though, repurposing those screening system stickers to show off some amazing artwork. We'll take a look at that when I join you at 6. Pretty cool. Thanks a lot, Tim. And one more check on our frigid cold mm -hmm. forecast. Yeah, it's going to be another cold one tonight as temperatures are going to drop down to around zero, slightly below zero tonight. And it does look like we might see a few flurries tonight, tomorrow, high of 13 degrees. We'll see more clouds tomorrow with calm winds. We'll have more higher snowfall chances a little bit later this week. All right, thanks, Marcus, and thank you for joining us. We'll both see you back here at 6, and until then, have a great night, everyone.